Today we're going to read from the Bhagavad Gita as it is, chapter 18, Perfection Renunciation, text number 57. karmani mai sanyasi matraha uriyogamu pashitya matshita saratam bhava In all activities depend upon me, and work always under my protection. In such devotional service, be fully conscious of me. Two brothers purport, when one acts in Krishna consciousness, he does not act as the master of the world. Just like a servant, one should act fully under the direction of the Supreme Lord. Servant has no individual independence. He acts only on the order of the master. The servant acting on behalf of the Supreme Master is unaffected by profit and loss. He simply discharges his duty faithfully in terms of the order of the Lord. Now, one may argue that Arjuna was acting under the personal direction of Krishna. But when Krishna is not present, how should one act? If one acts according to the direction of Krishna in this book, as well as under the guidance of the representative of Krishna, then the result will be the same. The Sanskrit word matparaha is very important in this verse. It indicates that one has no goal in life, save and accept acting in Krishna consciousness just to satisfy Krishna. While working that way, one should think of Krishna only. I've been appointed to discharge this particular duty by Krishna. While acting in such a way, one naturally has to think of Krishna. This is perfect Krishna consciousness. One should, however, note that after doing something whimsically, you should not offer the result to the Supreme Lord. That sort of duty is not in the devotional service of Krishna consciousness. One should act according to the order of Krishna. This is a very important point. That order of Krishna comes through the simple succession from the bona fide spiritual master. Therefore, the spiritual master's order should be taken as the prime duty of life. If one gets a bona fide spiritual master and acts according to his direction, then one's perfection of life in Krishna consciousness is guaranteed. So again, Chaitasa Sarva Karamani. Maya Sanyasya Matraha Uriyoga Mupashitya Matsita Sratam Bhava. In all activities, depend upon me, work always under my protection. In such devotional service, be fully conscious of me. Mamma Vishnu Vraya Krishna Prasthaya Buddha, Srimate Bhakti Viranta Swami Dinamane, Namaste Saraswati Deve, Gauravani Vacharane. Nirvishesha Shinivadi Paskajade Sitarne. The same process is given in all the chapters of Bhagavad Gita, how to become conscious of Krishna, just explained in different ways. Our philosophy is generally broken down into three different parts, known as Sambandha, Abhideya, and Parojana. Sambandha means the, the knowledge, the background, what is actually going on in this world and in the spiritual world. That's called Sambandha. And Abhideya is, on the basis of that knowledge, what should we, we, we be doing with our body, with our mind, and with our words, and ultimately with ourselves, the soul? And what do we expect is the perfection? What, what should we arrive at? What should we experience? if we actually accept the Sambandha and apply it in our lives called Abhideya, what should we expect to experience? That's called Prayojana. And in this verse, Sambandha, Abhideya, and Prayojana are simplified and summarized. Uh, our Sambandha is, as explains here, that everything is Krishna's property, eternally. And even Krishna, well, he doesn't exactly give us things on loan in that sense. It's not that he loans us something 
and he no longer has it. Uh, Krishna is eternally the proprietor of everything. He never is not the controller of everything. He may fulfill our desires according to what we deserve, but he always remains in control. So therefore, when we're acting, the idea is that one should act with knowledge of how everything is Krishna's property. And therefore not get into this idea of what the results are going to be for me. The result is that we remain eternally as we are, that is completely dependent upon Krishna. Now, of course, we can depend upon Krishna's energy called Maya. Uh, the only difference is that Maya will lead us to believe that we're doing things independently of Krishna. That's all. Just this idea that we're independent of Krishna, that's called Maya. We're not independent of Krishna. Even to be in Maya, we have to depend upon Krishna. Unless Krishna puts us in Maya, we can't be in Maya. Unless Krishna helps us, puts us in Krishna consciousness, we can't be Krishna conscious. Everything depends upon Krishna. But Krishna depends upon, Krishna will do according to what we desire. If we desire to become Krishna conscious, then we have to demonstrate that to Krishna. It's not that we just say, well, I woke up today, I, I think I'll become Krishna conscious. Well, that's nice, but then we have to do something. Whereas Shula Prabhupada used to say, first deserve and then desire. Therefore, much chitta, much kata, prana, bodhi, and taj parashparam, kata, and taj param, chamam nityam, tushanti cha, ramanti cha. The thoughts of my pure devotees, they dwell in me, their lives are surrendered to me, and they derive great satisfaction and bliss by enlightening one another and conversing about me. So these two words, chitta and prana, we're hearing, so we can call our chitta, we're trying to engage our intelligence so that we can hear what Krishna is saying, what Krishna's representative is saying, so our mind can be engaged. It's good to engage, first of all, our intellect, but then our mind should also be engaged. The mind is engaged in feel, thinking, feeling, and willing. Unless we're enthusiastic, no matter how intelligent we may think we are, it remains on the intellectual platform. We may hear that everything belongs to Krishna, but it won't have much effect upon us until we actually love Krishna. Otherwise, we may become envious. Oh, why does Krishna own everything? He's so greedy. He has to own everything. Why does he give something to us? Just like when Krishna was lifting Govardhan Hill with his left pinky for seven days, the coward men, they thought, oh, Krishna is holding up this hill. It must be pretty heavy. I'm sure his finger is getting tired. So we should assist him. And we should hold up Govardhan, help him hold, hold up Govardhan Hill. So they all took their sticks and they were holding up the hill with their sticks, thinking that now we're helping Krishna hold up Govardhan Hill. So then they said, Krishna, you can let the hill down. We'll hold it up. You can rest for a while. So Krishna said, all right. So he started to transfer the weight of Govardhan Hill to, to the coward man holding up the sticks. And suddenly the whole hill started to shake. And the coward men started to shake too, because this hill was just too heavy. And then Krishna took the weight back. So we may imagine that somehow or another, Krishna might give us Govardhan Hill to hold up by ourselves. Uh, but we probably find out quite quickly that that's not possible. We're not in control of any part of the material energy at any time. Although by our desire, certainly we influence what's going on. We influence at least what's going on with us. Purusha, Prakriti, Purusha, 
Prakriti Purusham Chaiva, Vidyanadi Upava P, Vikarnasha Ganam Chaiva, Vidyakar Prakriti Sambhava. The material nature is said to be the cause of all, of all causes and effect, while the living entity is the cause of different varieties of suffering and enjoyment. So we have our concern, a matter of fact, the conditioned soul in the material world is concerned about so many things. And especially in Kali Yuga, we're concerned about everything. If you go on the internet, you'll be concerned about what's going on on the moon planet right now, what their speculations are, what to speak, what's going on in different parts of the world. As if by this overload of information, we can, we're helping the situation. Since we're not actually controlling the situation, except through our desires, of course, we can pray, for instance, if some problem is going on in the world, we can pray to Krishna to please help. And according to how devotional we are, Krishna will respond to our prayers. But as it says, the thief, he's praying that Krishna, please give me the intelligence so I can steal from this house today. And the householder is praying, my dear Krishna, please give me the intelligence how to protect myself from thieves. So Krishna is confused. Who should, whose desire should he fulfill? The thief's desire or the householder who wants to protect his belongings? So Krishna has a, hard, has a difficult job. He has to fill everyone's desires. And sometimes the different desires run contrary to each other. But Krishna figures it all out. And in the due course of time, everyone gets their desires fulfilled according to what they deserve. Of course, if we believe that whatever we have within our influence, we should utilize in Krishna's service, and then Krishna is very happy to give us intelligence to do that. If we believe that everything I have, or some things that I have, or whatever I have, is actually mine, then, and we, I want to utilize it in my personal service, then Krishna will try to discourage us from doing that because it's a waste of time. Of course, if we pray to Krishna, my dear Lord, please help me, you know, utilize these things in your service for my benefit then Krishna might help to encourage us. In any case, the quickest way to get the, quick, the best desire is to recognize that everything belongs to Krishna. And if we utilize in Krishna's service, then we won't get burnt by the illusory energy. Of course, we're so used to being in anxiety. We're so used to being influenced by the past and the future that we don't even notice it sometimes. It seems completely normal to be fearful and to be in anxiety and lament, to go from hankering to lamentation to fear and anxiety. And sometimes we even dovetail that with the idea that actually I'm trying to do something. I'm, I'm in anxiety for the sake of, the, of Krishna. Like Mother Jasoda was always anxious that Krishna not be captured by birds or the cows may not run him over or the Krishna may be, not be hungry. Mother Jasoda was always anxious for Krishna. So that's very nice. And sometimes we think we're anxious for Krishna in the same way as Mother Jasoda, but that may be true and that's very good. We may worry about our devotional service or other people's devotional service or the movement, what's going on, or so many things. But often our worries are mixed up with our own desires. What we think is should be done. In other words, we think we know better than Krishna. Then unless we put our finger into the pie, it will never get cooked properly as if Krishna doesn't know what he's doing. And unless we 
try to interfere, things won't go the way they should go. Therefore, at the beginning of Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, Masuchaha, don't worry. If you just find out what you're supposed to do, what I want you to do, I'll take care of everything else. So that's quite a good lesson to learn. In other words, if we actually believe Krishna is controlling every atom in the material and spiritual universes, then we, we can more or less imagine he's pretty good at what he's doing. And that he knows what has to be done. He knows what's not supposed to be done. And if we leave it up to him, he'll do a pretty good job. He's been pretty expert since eternity. I think he'll probably still keep on doing a good job. But because we have our own conceptions about what's going on, sometimes we think Krishna is sleeping at the wheel. And that's an American expression, meaning that somehow or another, he's a nice person. He's just so old, he doesn't know what he's doing anymore. And therefore he gets confused and things don't go on the way they should. Look, at least according to the way I think they should be going on. But actually Krishna is doing a good job and he has a very good plan and he knows how he's going to fulfill that plan. And what he wants us to be is simply an instrument. Nimitra, matram, sava, sava, sachin. Just be an instrument. And then we can breathe, ah, sigh of relief, that the whole material and spiritual universes are not on our shoulder, that we have to do everything, we have to save the world, or we have to save our friend, or we have to save our enemy. We have to save anyone except for ourselves. That doesn't mean that we have no responsibility but to help others, but our first responsibility to help others is to find out what Krishna wants us to do, or if he even wants us to help anyone, or he, who he wants us to help. Now we can put in a petition to Krishna because we're our souls, but still ultimately we have to rely upon Krishna and find out what his plan is and how he wants us to fit in to help him complete, to fulfill it. Then that's all we have to do. We don't have to worry about anything else. Arjuna was worried about the problems that are going to happen with his relatives if he fought in the battlefield of Kurukshetra. Then he worried about the outcome. What would happen if I killed all these elderly members of the family? How the whole society would just fall apart. So Arjuna felt a very heavy burden on his shoulders. What was going to be the outcome of the battle of Kurukshetra? Krishna is telling me to fight, but I don't like what's going to happen. So I think that maybe it's not a good idea. Uh, Krishna, uh, I think I'm going to lay down my bow and arrow, and I'm going to sit on the chariot, take out my iPhone, and watch the battle on, on the internet from a safe distance. Do you have any popcorn? No, Krishna didn't appreciate that very much. He said, yes, actually, he showed Arjuna, actually, I've taken care of the whole thing. Dronam cha, bhishmam cha, jayasratam cha, karnam dittayam patadiyodiyavyam. That Dronam, Karna, Bhishma, they were all been killed already. Just fight and conquer your enemies. They were put to death by my arrangement. And you, as Savasachin, can be but an instrument in the fight. So if we reduce ourselves to being an instrument, if we accept ourselves as the dasa, dasa, anodasa, the servant of the servant of the servant of Krishna, and simply try to become an instrument for Krishna, then all our anxieties and worries will gradually go away. Because it takes a while to actually accept this philosophy and apply it within our lives. We're so used to be thinking ourselves to be controllers that we think if, unless I put my, if I take my hands off my anxiety, if I let my anxiety go down for a few seconds or a few minutes, then the whole world will cave in, that I'm supporting the world through my anxiety. 
And unless my vision becomes a reality in this world, the whole world will fall apart. Kali Yuga will set in, the devotees will fall in Maya. That simply by my vision being manifested in this world, with the help of Krishna, of course, he can help out because he's, he's, he's also a nice person. So he can also help fulfill my vision, which will make everything nicer and better and eventually put me as the hero that I've saved so many living entities. I've saved the world. I'm the Messiah. The only problem is that people didn't realize it, but now gradually I'm being recognized for who I actually am. So this kind of mentality is a great burden to think ourselves other than the servant of the servant of the servant of Krishna, other than just trying to find out how to utilize Krishna's energies and Krishna's service. Now, what to speak when you become an initiating guru? Please mute whoever is there. The tendency, ooh. Do we have someone muting? Agnihotra, are you the host? You can mute if someone's not muted. What to speak of you think you become a spiritual ma initiating spiritual master, and then everyone starts saying, you know, Guru Maharaj, you know, you're my spiritual master, and I belong to you. That's very good for the disciple. Now, if the spiritual master thinks the initiating guru or any guru, instructing guru starts thinking, oh, that's very nice. Before I was just a lonely brahmachari or a sannyasi or a grihasta, and now I have so many things. I have so, I, so many, I, as Prabhupada said, I have so many children. That I'm a sannyasi, I'm not allowed to have children, but now I have a hundred or three hundred, a thousand or fifty thousand children. And I don't have to take care of them, they take care of me. What a nice arrangement. But I actually probably gave the vision of an actual bona fide spiritual master. He knows that he can't own anything in this world, everything belongs to Krishna. There's nothing that we can claim as our own. Because Krishna can, through his material nature or spiritual energy, controls everything. We can desire, and if we desire to become a servant of our spiritual master in this simple succession, then we're in our rightful position as the servant of the servant of the servant of Krishna. And Due to the fact that we're desiring to serve our spiritual master either by his vapu or his vani. Vani means his words, and vapu means his physical presence. So by serving his instructions, but where do the instructions come from? He's repeating what his spiritual master is told, him within the heart, and his spiritual master is repeating what he's been is being told by his spiritual master in his heart. And ultimately, the person who's instructing everyone as a super soul, including our acharyas and disciples succession, is Krishna within everyone's heart, within the heart of all the acharyas. So Krishna is giving the acharya the instructions what to tell us. And we're hearing it. And when we tell others, and if they follow those instructions, we can't claim it's our instructions. We know that only by the mercy of the super soul and our spiritual master in the super succession that we have any knowledge at all. We can say anything about Krishna. And therefore, when we see our disciples or followers following those instructions, then we think when we learn from them how to become a better servant of our spiritual master. We see them not as our servants, but as the servants of our acharyas and disciples succession. And because we were acting as one of their servants, 
Therefore, we can convey the knowledge of the in disciple succession appropriately to serve our disciples and followers so they can serve the disciple succession and ultimately Krishna. So the spiritual master, whether Diksha or Shiksha, doesn't see himself as a spiritual master. He sees himself as a servant of his spiritual master eternally. And he sees his disciples and followers as a, a kind of spiritual master because they're showing him how, they, how to better serve his spiritual master. They're showing him by, they're following the instructions coming from his spiritual master, how to become a better servant of his spiritual master. So this philosophy of becoming a proprietor of the material world is exactly the opposite in the consciousness of what we're trying to achieve in Krishna consciousness. Now, of course, if we have nothing, as they say, some philosophers said, if you have nothing, then you have nothing to lose. If you have little, then there's little chance of feeling yourself a proprietor. And the more things in the material world you get, then the more a tendency is to become attached to them. Now in conditioned life, even if we have a nice pen that we're attached to, if we lose it, we become an anxiety. What happened to my pen? I can't live without that pen. You search for the pen the whole day. An anxiety, where is it? How could I have lost it? My life is a failure. And what to speak if you have a family? How much more tendency is there to get attached to the family? This is my wife. These are my children. This is my dog. This is my house. This is mine. And I am the father. I am the husband. I am the proprietor. I am the master. And then, Krishna, if you can help me, please maintain my kingdom, then I also accept you somewhere in the house. I put you in a little place in the house, give you a little box to sleep in, some water every day, and please maintain my house, my house. I invited you to come here. I feed you a little fruit every day, some water, so please don't complain. And take care of my house, my family. <laughs> That this house, my so-called house, my, first of all, my mind, it's not even my mind. I have a choice. I can think that these are the thoughts, this is the intelligence Krishna is giving me by the mercy of my spiritual master. Or I can think, oh, these are wonderful thoughts, how I'm going to become either successful in the material world and recognize, or I can avoid all these problems that other people are creating for me, or the material nature is creating for me. So we can, we can think that this mind is meant for my happiness, to get what I want and to avoid what I don't want. Or I can think that this mind is Krishna's and should be utilized in Krishna's service. Manasadeho, and my body also. I should find out what Krishna wants me to do with this body. And I should do it. Manasadeho, geho, yo kichimo. And everything else I have, my family, my, my wife, my husband, my children, and even my pet dog, if I have one. Everything should be utilized for Krishna's pleasure. And anything beyond that, anything besides that, then I'll get entangled. Maya will come and say, very good. I think if anyone should be a proprietor in this universe, it should be you. You know, Krishna has enough, don't worry. He's not going to complain. He's not, he's not going to go hungry. You just take your part, your share, and everything will be all right. And I'll give you all the worries and all the anxieties, and you can try to figure out what to do to keep your part of the creation. Now, if we actually accept Krishna as the proprietor and we actually try to get out of this illusory conception that I am the controller and I am the enjoyer 
it doesn't go away just by, I think, well, all right, today I think I won't be the proprietor today. Let Krishna be the proprietor. I need a couple of days off anyhow. It's been hard trying to maintain the universe. So let Krishna be the proprietor. But if we actually accept Krishna as the proprietor, then we have to find out what Krishna wants us to do. And what Krishna wants us to do is not necessarily the first thing that comes to my mind. I know of devotees who want to do something which is, was not very necessarily very bona fide. But they went before Prabhupada, they prayed to Prabhupada, Prabhupada, please give me the, I want to do this. I want to harm this devotee. I need your mercy to do it. I need your, you know, your sanction to do it. Please give me the all, empower me to do this sinful activity. And after an hour or two, one thinks, well, Krishna, Prabhupada, you know, he heard my plea. I'm sure he heard it. I'm sure he's going to empower me. If he would have disagreed with me, he would have said something. I didn't hear anything from him. So let me go and do what I want, uh, what I was going to do. Because I'm sure I'm correct. No, one has to, it, one has to become sincere. Uh, that sincerity is really the basis of our spiritual advancement. To actually consider deeply what Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita. As Prabhupada said, if one has a bona fide spiritual master, if what Krishna is, if Krishna is not present as he was with Arjuna on the battlefield of Kurukshetra, then how does one know how to act? So Prabhupada writes, if one acts according to Krishna's direction in this book, as well as under the direction of the representative of Krishna, then the result will be the same. Krishna is personally directing us. <laughs> Please mute. Any hope for you know who's not muted? Any hope can you mute the person who's not muted? Okay. So now this takes some sincerity, some sense, quote, sincerity. Sincer what does sincerity mean? It means we actually stop, we actually set aside our first impulse and we start thinking about what is the circumstances I'm under? What should I be doing? What should I be saying? How should I think? Usually it follows in that order. First of all, what should I do? What should I think and what should I say? And how should I say it? How should I think about it? And we all have a tendency, you know, a natural tendency. So whatever circumstances we're under, we have a natural reaction. We look at someone and we think, you know, actually, I, all kinds of emotions come up in our mind. We think I have five minutes to spare. spare. What can I do? What, should, what do I want to do? Rather than what Krishna wants me to do. I look at someone, I think, you know, this is this person, he stole my glove, love, love, love in yesterday. I don't want to wish ill of them, but someone should punish them. How can I get even with them? Next time they have a glove room and I'll steal it from them. The natural Maya will immediately give us some thought. Everything we see, everything we smell, everything we taste, everything we hear, we get a natural reaction to it. But to step back and think, now here is a person, I don't like them, and I have a whole book I can write about why I don't like them. I know every sinful activity they've done in three lifetimes. And I'm completely justified. I'm only hate, I only dislike them for the good of the world. 
But then when we, if we actually think, is this what Krishna would like me to see? How would he would like me to see this person? Is it actually enlivening in Krishna consciousness to me? Is Krishna even in the picture? Do I actually believe that within their heart there's a super soul? Do I actually believe that maybe deep inside what they're doing is somehow or another connected with Krishna consciousness and with pure devotional service? And maybe I'm not Yamaraj. Maybe I didn't incarnate myself in this world in order to save it, in order to protect it, in order to pass judgment on everyone I see and everything I, I hear about. That I have to get involved in everything that's going on in the world to protect it. That by, by my desire, things go well. And by my desire, things don't go well. By my desire, the creation comes about. By my desire, things are maintained. And by my desire, everything is annihilated at the end. Or in some time. No, we have to step back and think, all right, what are the circumstances I'm under now? What are the things that I, um, Krishna wants me to do? That's why it's good to keep an agenda or keep a list of to-do lists. Because otherwise we forget. We tell someone I'm going to do this or we, we're obligated to do that and we just forget. And then we think, well, I got so many things to do. I'm just going to do whatever I'd like to do. <laughs> it's human. I'm too much in anxiety to, to figure out what I'm supposed to do because there's just too many things to do. So I'm just going to do whatever I feel like. You know, should I take prasadam or should I read a book? Should I take a rest? Should I go to the temple room? Should I chant my rounds? Should I call this person up? Oh, this is just too much for my mind. I think I just go to sleep and forget about it all. <laughs> I should worry about so many things. That's why it's good to take, make a list of the things we're supposed to be doing and then figure out what does Krishna want me to do? It's not that, let me find out what Krishna wants me to do. And if he wants me to do something, he's going to tell me within the heart or send me, send me a message by email if he really wants me to do something. No, if Krishna, want, he, he, Krishna wants us to figure out what, we're, what he wants us to do by first of all, finding out, writing down all the things we're supposed to do. And then Krishna will give us the intelligence how to put them in a certain order of doing them. What's the, what's the priority? What, what order he wants us to do things. He'll give it didami buddhi yogam tam. He'll give us the intelligence what to do. Now, of course, we should read Bhagavad Gita. That's one of the things, is, or the scriptures. Because Krishna not only wants us to do, do, do things with his body, he also wants us to do things with our mind. He wants us to see things in a certain way, to understand things in a certain way, to feel in a certain way, to be able to change our feelings when we see that they're wrong feelings, to change from, oh, I'm, you know, I hate this person or I, I'm in love with them, materially in love with them. He wants us to change that to a little bit more sober type of consciousness where we see things in relationship to him and we appreciate, for instance, devotees' devotional service, whatever they're doing for Krishna, and at the same time, see what they're not doing in devotional service and not get angry at them and frustrated and envious of them. Why are they doing these things? Why can't I do them? How is it they're getting away with it? Why didn't Krishna strike them with a thunderbolt? for doing the wrong thing? Why am I afraid he'll strike me with a thunderbolt so I can't do what they're doing? No, don't be envious. We shouldn't be envious of people. We shouldn't be envious of the devotees that do, they're doing something I'd really like to do, but I'm afraid if I do it, I'll get in trouble. But they're doing it and they don't look like they're getting in trouble. So why this unfairness? Why shouldn't they get in trouble like I'm afraid of getting in trouble? Hmm. 
No, we should appreciate what the devotees are doing in devotional service and recognize where are they perhaps are not following so strictly the rules and regulations or the desires of our acharya and not become envious of them, but not try to imitate them either. If we become envious, then we'll develop the same desire that they have. And if we appreciate what they're doing in devotional service, then we'll become inspired to do something more in devotional service too. And don't associate intimately, mentally inclusive, inclusive and include uh, also, we shouldn't include it, include it, inclusive, whatever, including associating with them mentally all the things they're doing wrong. But instead, finding out what they're doing right and becoming inspired by that, and then we'll become inspired to do the right thing also. So it's like that famous story of the prostitute and the Brahmin, which I've told many times, how the prostitute was a great devotee of Krishna, but she was by somehow or another, by fate, she was engaged in an occupation which is not very appreciable. But there was a very saintly Brahmin who was living across the street from her. And every time he saw that the, the prostitute had another client, he'd make a mark on a tree and think how this prostitute's going to hell because she's so sinful. And the prostitute, every time she saw the Brahmin, she thought of how a great devotee he was and how he was so pious and, and devotional and that she was so praying that one day she could become pious and devotional like he was. So at the end of life, then the Brahman was thinking of the prostitute, how sinful she was, and he went to hell. And the prostitute was thinking of the pious Brahman, how pious he was, how devotional he was, thinking of that Brahman, he, she went back to the spiritual world. So we have to be careful where our minds are going also, how we're feeling about others, how we're thinking about them. And even if we find something negative, then we should try to see if we can help them, if that's within our range of possibility, or we should just simply appreciate what they're doing in devotional service and not intimately associate with them mentally with their wrongdoings. And our main business is to find out by getting the overview of Bhagavad Gita, getting the knowledge of Bhagavad Gita, so that when we get instructions from our gurus, whether Shiksha gurus or Diksha gurus, we see how this fits into the Bhagavad Gita, how this is actually coming down from Krishna in disciple succession. Ordinarily, if we actually have a bona fide guru, if we have a bona fide Diksha or a Shiksha guru, Whatever they're saying, if we have knowledge of the Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam, Bhagavad Gita, Krishna will give us the intelligence how it fits in. It's not that we're going to figure out how it fits in. Look, if we are sincere, then Krishna will give us the intelligence how it fits into, his, into his, the instructions in his books, in his teachings. If we read the books, of course. If we read other things, then it's not going to be very helpful because then we all only understand how the teachings fit in, how the instructions fit into other things besides Krishna consciousness. But that won't be very helpful. In any case, whatever instructions we're going to be given by our Diksha Guru, by our Shiksha Guru, we're going to see how it fits in in some way in our lives. And if we study Time Magazine, our local newspaper, if we go on the internet, then we'll only get the intelligence from Krishna, how it fits into the, these instructions coming from non-devotional sources, generally speaking. And if we study Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam, Chaitanya Charitamrita, then the instructions coming from anyone, whether it be our Shiksha Guru or our Diksha Guru, then Krishna will give us the intelligence to understand how it fits into devotional principles, how to apply those instructions in such a way as that will advance in spiritual life. 
And if we accept ourselves as the servants of the servants of the servants of Krishna, then our diksha, shiksha gurus, will be able to give, they'll give us the intelligence how everyone we come in contact with will understand how to serve them appropriately in Krishna's service. It's not that we're only becoming a servant of one diksha guru or even some shiksha gurus. We're trying to become servant of every living entity eventually. To know how to deal with them in such a way is to help them somehow or another reconnect themselves in some way to Krishna. It is not that everyone we come in contact with is necessarily interested in being instructed by us or will even appreciate our example, whatever. Uh, so this takes intelligence, how to assist others in Krishna consciousness. For instance, if one goes out in book distribution, it's not that everyone's going to stop and take a book and give us a huge donation or fall down on the street and think, oh, you're, you're the savior. Thank you very much for coming onto the street and saving all living entities, especially me. Uh, I think once in a lifetime, you'll find someone like that. Maybe. But when people are passing by, we should be friendly. And even if says something, you know, someone says something, you need to say, have a good day. Rather than being becoming antagonistic or becoming resentful, or looking at everyone, you know, how big their wallet is, and I re relate to them accordingly. Now to try, if they take a book, then thank them, give them an invitation to come to the temple. If they don't, try to get, maybe some people ask them to chant Hare Krishna, or at least say, have a good day, maybe we'll see you later. Uh, be friendly to all living entities, and treat everyone as if they were uh, uh, that an actual pandit sees all living entities as just like oneself. I know one sannyasi, every time he saw the devotees, when he was, before he became a devotee, he crossed over the street to avoid them. And sometimes when he saw the devotees, if he couldn't avoid them, he'd take the book and rip it up that was handed to him. But one day he got a book, he stole it, went back to home and decided to take a look at it to find out what it was all about. Con became interested in Krishna consciousness, joined the movement and later on became a sannyasi. So we may think that this person is a demon, they deserve to go to hell, but I don't think that's why we went out there to distribute books to help people qualify themselves to go to hell. They're already qualified fully. We don't have to encourage them. But we should try to help them, like Vodnitinanda. Generally speaking, if someone hit, hit us with a pot, we wouldn't go up to them and ask them to chant Hare Krishna. And I certainly don't recommend that. If someone starts hitting with the pot, I think the best thing to do is run or protect yourself in some way. But Lord Nityananda was so kind that he saved Jagai Madai. Because that's, he was doing it on behalf of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Because Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, that was, he knew this is Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's desire. Now, if we accept everything belongs to Krishna and we actually find out since, uh, what Krishna wants us to do, and then the next stage is we want to do that activity to please Krishna. In other words, we know everything belongs to Krishna and we know what Krishna wants us to do through Guru, Sadhu, and Shastra. And then we do it with care and attention. That we put everything else out of our minds, not everything else, it's not that we become unaware of what's going on, but all the other things that we have in our mind that are not relevant to what we're supposed to be doing, we can safely put out of our minds while we're doing our service, knowing well that Krishna is not going to let them go over down hill down because we're not full of anxiety, thinking that, you know, if I don't keep all these things in my mind all the time, you know, 
the whole world will collapse. Govardhan Hill will fall down. But Krishna will keep on holding our Govardhan Hill up while we do our service, because he, he promises us that. That Ma Sujaha, if you just surrender to me, don't worry, I'll protect you from all other things, that, reactions that may come. And if we do it with care and attention, what will be the result? What is our final reward for all this endeavor to accept everything belongs to Krishna and find out what Krishna wants us to do through himself and his books and his representatives? What will be our final re reward when we do it with love and attention? The re result was, as Prabhupada writes here, we'll remember Krishna. That's our success in life. Smarta Vyaksaratam Vishnur, Vismarta Jatuna Kinchet, Saravidi Nisedya Syur, Etiyar Eva Kingra. That all this, everything we're doing, whether any rule or regulation that we're following, the result of all these things are the final result is culminated in always remembering Krishna and never forgetting it. If we just remember Krishna, that I'm Krishna's servant, that here is Krishna, he has a flute, he has a peacock feather, he has friends like Shrimati Rarani, Sudama, Mother Jasoda, Nana Maharaj, then that's the success of our activity. That we, we're doing activity with devotion and remembering we're inspired by all these other great devotees to do it even with more devotion, more care. We see our gurus in disciple succession and how they're inspired by these great devotees in Srimad Bhagavatam, Chaitanya Charitamrita, and other books. How they're inspired by their devotion, how they're remembering their devotion, and therefore they're inspired experiencing Krishna consciousness on a deeper and deeper level. Krishna is revealing himself on a deeper and deeper level. One is entering into the world of, of devotion, of Krishna consciousness. So that's our success in life. And as Prabhupada just says here, if one acts whimsically, and what is whimsically? It means we didn't go through this consideration. We didn't accept everything belongs to Krishna and we decide to serve lust or anger or greed and we become delusional and then we didn't like the results so we offered to Krishna. Here's the blind cow, I don't know what to do with it. Why, why don't you give it to the temple? Let them figure out what to do with it. Or one man's walking with puffed rice in his hand and on a plate and the wind comes along and blows it away. So he calls out, go in the bow. Let, let, Krishna, take care of it. If we want to become Krishna conscious, then we have to follow the process. And if we don't follow the process, then we won't become Krishna conscious. It's that simple. So the process is there in the verse. We can study it eternally, and we'll get more and more realizations about it because it's such a fantastic verse. So thank you, Hare Krishna. Any questions or comments? Yes, the Maharaj in group. Yes, it is a question from Mata Jalavantavata. Why acceptance and dependence on the job, temple authorities, husband or friend feels so easy and natural? Why is it so hard to accept dependence on the Lord? Well, you're very fortunate that you feel that dependence on the job, the temple, authorities, husband or friend feels easy and natural to you. It doesn't come easy and natural to everyone. But why is it so hard to accept dependence on the Lord? Well, if we accept dependence on the Lord, I mean, there's a process of doing it. Uh, one of the processes begins by just taking the time to regularly hear about Krishna. If we don't understand Krishna, how sweet he is, how sweet his devotees are, how intelligent he is, 
how much he's our friend, then it seems rather unnatural because we, we already have in our brain these conceptions of if I was the controller, if I was God, how would I take care advantage of it? If I could even get some mystic powers, how I'd utilize them. So what to speak of God who has all mystic power? So it's very hard for us to accommodate a person who's the controller of everything and a person who is unlimitedly sweet and loving and doesn't use his power for anything selfish on his part, but simply utilizes his power and authority for the benefit of everyone else. That Krishna doesn't have a selfish spiritual bone in his body. He's simply concerned with love for all his devotees eternally. So it's hard for us to conceive of anyone like that and depend upon him to understand that at every moment he simply wants to give us intelligence for our benefit and for everyone else's benefit. So it takes some practice. And therefore we have to learn what the role of the super soul is, what the role of this creation is, what our role is here. So many things we have to learn and then we have to practice it. And as Krishna reveals himself, as we become more aware of actually what Krishna's nature and what he's like and our relationship with him, then it becomes easier and easier to depend upon him. Depending upon him doesn't mean that Krishna, I have my list of things that if you fulfill them, then you're a good person. Then I like you. And if you don't do everything I think you're supposed to do, then something's wrong with you. And I think I'll depend upon someone else. Probably gives the example that people used to go to the church and pray for bread. But then they discovered that there's bread in the supermarket. So they thought, well, if I just get some money and go to the supermarket, I don't have to go to church anymore. I don't have to get up early on Sunday. I can just sleep in and later on I can go to the market and I can get my bread. They don't realize where the bread comes from. That the supermarket gathered from Krishna ultimately. So that dependence on Krishna we have to learn. Otherwise, we think we're dependent on so many other things, but ultimately we're all dependent all the time on Krishna. And he's a nice person. And it's better to depend upon him directly than to depend upon him indirectly and have to suffer or so-called enjoy the results of our previous activities, which some of them may be pleasant and some of them may not be very pleasant for us. Niti Seva Devi Dasi. Hare Krishna Gurudev, please accept my humble obeisances all to Sushila Prabhupada. Uh, I just wanted to ask um, uh, how we can deal sometimes, uh, you know, any uh, differences uh, with devotees, but keeping in mind a respectful um, attitude and their good qualities, you know, and ultimately we all are serving the same family, Krishna's family, you know, and Krishna. Um, and uh, because, you know, we all come from different cultures, our society is so big coming from different cultures and different upbringings and different moods and natures, you know. So sometimes it can happen that two devotees have good intentions, but sometimes can be, can have some difference, you know. So uh, how we can deal with that, but in a respectful way and in a devotional way. Well, we can study Srila Prabhupada's books. Thank you for the question. We can study Prabhupada's books and see how other great devotees dealt with similar situations that we're faced with. Or we can see good examples how devotees who are more advanced than we are deal with such situations. Or we can pray the super soul within our heart to give us some vision of how to, and intelligence, how to deal with the situation. So humbly, we have to investigate how to deal with such situations. And then when we becomes clear by the mercy of Krishna, how to deal with it, then we can act. Still, then we have to humbly investigate. It's not that at every moment, in every instance, we're going to know exactly how to think and what to say and what to do. 
it takes some humility and investigation often to find out what the correct mood is, what the correct activities are, what the correct vision should be. And then when we choose the right one after, and we act with some determination, then Krishna will help us. He'll give us the intelligence, he'll give us the enlightenment, he'll make the arrangements to assist us that in making advancement in devotional service, so that eventually these type of activity, these type of decisions, these types of visions, these types of thoughts and feelings become spontaneous and natural in the course of time, devotionally. But in the meantime, we have to study, we have to inquire humbly, and when everything becomes clear, then we can act with conviction, and then we can see whether it worked or not, whether it actually produced the devotional feelings that I was looking for. Thank you. So I think we'll stop there. I have, an, I have another class right now. Thank you for your nice association, for your kind attention. We look forward to seeing you soon again. Have a good week or two weeks. Grantaraj, Shimad Bhagavad Gita, Kijai, Shila Prabhupada, Kijai, 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 Kijai